right, y'all, we're going to get straight to the text. Uh, Psalm 46, what will be tonight? Psalms 46. We're going to read uh, 46, 1 through 11, the whole chapter, and then we'll get into a recap and then get into the word. Psalms 46. To the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah, a song, <clears throat> excuse me, for Alamoth. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just, as the, just at the break of dawn. The nations rage, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Most high God, we thank you for your holy word. It's holy, it's mighty. It's sufficient to save, sanctify, and build up. I thank you tonight that we can worship you and exalt you willingly. Bless the teaching of your word and the hearing of it also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Quick recap. Verse 11. Nevertheless, the children of Korah did not die. There was a remnant of the sons of Korah who chose to obey God rather than man. And they were spared, they were saved, they were delivered. So we see them again in Numbers 28. And we talked about a few things. We talked about what it really means to, for God to be your refuge, your shelter, your place of safety. Amen. He is your shelter from the storms of life. We talked about various storms of life, tumultuous marriages, problems in the marriage. Mourning the loss of a loved one and navigating through that pain. Not mourning, M-O-R-N-I-N-G, but mourning, sorrow. The storms of financial struggles. We said payday wasn't paying. The check wasn't checking. God is our shelter and our refuge, our safety in hard times. We also talked about problems on the job. Being overlooked on the job, being overworked, being undervalued. When the people are in power, the people mourn. When the wicked are in power, the people mourn. So being in that distress, God is our refuge. God is our shelter. Amen. We talked about the storms of prodigal children, the storms of sickness in your body, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, and lastly, we talk about the wages of sin and the cycle of sinfulness. You're not being saved. You're being oppressed by sin. Jesus is our refuge. We run to him with urgency and we find refuge. We find safety. We find salvation. We posed the question last, last month, is God your refuge? Is God your refuge? Like a man who is traveling to a city of refuge, 
for his own safety and well-being, we travel with urgency and vigor and diligence to our refuge, the Most High God. This is how we should seek shelter in him. Pursue God with urgency and diligence because he is our refuge. In other words, he is the only hope for safety and salvation. Yes, sir. What other refuge do you have other than Christ? We kind of talked about some things. People put their, their hope and their trust and seek safety in family members, in their wealth, horoscopes, crystals, weird things. In Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men, men whereby we must be saved. That tells us that Jesus is our only refuge, our only safety. Is God your refuge? That was our question. Tonight I don't have a question, but I have more of a statement. Tonight I want to talk to you from the topic of God is our strength. Amen. God is our strength. He, he's not, uh, he not will be, he might be. Amen. Present tense, he is. He will always be our strength. Last month I asked the question, is God your refuge? Tonight I declare to you that God is your strength. Point number one, strength. Let's go ahead and define it by way of definition. Right here in Psalms 46, strength translates to a few different words. Number one, it translates to power. Say that with me, say power. Power, power is the ability to do something or complete a specific or particular task. The ability, supernatural ability in this sense, to do something or complete a specific task. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Now those plans are very particular, are very specific to you. And the strength that you need to complete those specific tasks is also a very specific strength. The source is very particular. Who is your strength? God is our strength. That word strength also translates to the word force. The word force, by definition, is to push or pull, a push or a pull, exerted on an object or situation, causing it to change its motion, its direction, and its state of being. Anybody have a situation that you would like God to change? Anybody have some circumstances that's going in a certain direction that you need a shift? That you need some strength to redirect the situation? Any circumstances you're experiencing that, can, that could use some motion? Circumstances at a, at a standstill, no motion. Same old, same old. Anybody need some force in the right direction? got good news for you. That word strength, it means strength. It is the capacity of an object or person to withstand a great force or to withstand great pressure. Anybody under pressure? Anybody ever been under pressure and was in need of strength? This strength, this power, this force is not just any kind of strength. It's not like the strength of you and I. God gave me an example just yesterday. I run a mile twice a week with the guys I train with. I'm the trainer, and I'm leading the pack. And just so I've been running a mile, what, I don't know, maybe six months, I strained my left calf. God was telling me that your strength fails. Your strength is prone to failure. It's very liable to fail. Not just one time like me, but often. Amen. 
We're referring to a strength that's not like ours. We were actually referring here to the strength of God, the strength of Yah, the most high God, the creator of all things. God's strength is an eternal strength. It surpasses time. It surpasses the beginning. It surpa he was strong before Genesis, and he's going to be strong after Revelations. He's mighty and powerful before the foundations of the earth. And at the end, he won't uh, have 40% left. You know how your battery goes down? You need to charge your battery. God don't never need to charge up. He don't ever need to charge up. He was strong in the Old Testament when he delivered Israel out of Egypt and crushed the strength of Pharaoh. He is strong right now, still saving, still healing, and still delivering lost souls. He's strong right now, still transforming souls from darkness to light. He has strength to come. He has strength to come, such as when he cracks the eastern sky and returns to the earth to judge the living and the dead. I'm talking about the strength of God. Anybody in here need the strength of God yes, sir. Yes, sir. for anything in your life? By way of experience, anybody ever experienced the strength of God, yes, the power of God? Yes, Something that occurred in your life that you don't have an explanation for? It? That's salvation. That's deliverance. That's healing. That's miraculous provision. What's the source of that? The strength, the power, the might, the force of God. It's not a question tonight, but it's a declaration. God is our strength. Point number two, and we'll get into some sub points. I'm going to be uh, flipping the Bible to a few uh, scriptures throughout our study, so bear with me. Point number two is this, areas of importance needing God's strength. In other words, these are some areas of importance that we need God's strength. Some important areas. So point A, we need strength to forgive. Strength to forgive. First scripture we are in, Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses against you, neither will the fa your father forgive your trespasses. This passage of scripture in Matthew is a nod to salvation. Forgiveness is this. Forgiveness is squaring up with a person that done you wrong. Yes, sir. Look them in the face and stating the specific wrong done against you. Read them their rights. Tell them everything that they ever did to you. Everything you're feeling, all the impact of it. What they did and all of its collateral damages. And after saying all your peace, everything that, that was done against you, you look them in the eyes and you say, I forgive you. And I release you. I forgive you, I release you of guilt, I release you of the responsibility for this wrongdoing against me. If you are judged for your actions, then it won't be by me. Come on. Come on, brother. I, I release it. I release it. The world sees that as weakness. But in the kingdom, that's called strength. That's called strength. Well, how can you say that? Well, that's exactly what God did. That's exactly what God made available to us. How? By dying on the cross. He looked us in the face. You see all this wrong that you've done? The sins you've committed? I forgive you. I forgive you. 
by way of this cross, by the shedding of this blood, unto those who believe. He became the payment for sin. He purchased our forgiveness. And to everyone who believes on Yahshua, by the blood of Jesus, we are forgiven, released from guilt, and not held responsible for our sins. In fact, now when the Father looks upon those who believe on Jesus, when he looks at them, he doesn't see their sins anymore. He sees the righteousness of Christ. And the Bible said that he takes our sins, he takes the forgiven, those who are forgiven, he takes their sins and casts them as far as the east is from the west. I haven't tried, but try to measure that. Try to go find that. No longer responsible, eternally responsible for the sins we've committed. That's called strength. I see strength in that. That's grace. Grace is strength. God gives us strength to forgive. And we see that through his example of the cross. Now, that's grace, that's forgiveness, that's power, that's strength, that's might in a spiritual sense. Now, do we use that grace as a license to sin? God forbid. Absolutely not. It's God, God's grace that gives us access to forgiveness of our sins and newness of life. It's his grace. It's his strength. Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, the Bible says, so you also must do. Christ's example of forgiveness is strength. He gives us strength to forgive also. God commands us to forgive. I'm reminded of a parable. Perhaps you've heard the parable before as well, that of the unforgiving servant. The king forgives the servant who owes him a huge debt, owe him a lot of money. But the servant refuses to forgive the fellow servant who owes him a small debt. Y'all remember what happened to the servant? The king punishes the unforgiving servant by having him tortured until he can uh, restore his debt. That's a picture of God's call for us to forgive. God gives us strength to forgive. So point B, he also gives us strength not only for some things, to accomplish some things, but he gives us strength against some things. God gives us strength, strength against evil. Against evil. In Acts 19, 13, we'll read. <clears throat> 13 through 16, the Bible says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. The evil spirit answered and said this, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was, was leaped on them and overpowered them and prevailed against them. So much so that they fled out of the house, unclothed and wounded. Unclothed and battered, some translations say. Fighting against evil in your own strength will only leave you unclothed and battered. The sons of Sceva were merely repeating what they heard and what they saw. They never experienced God like Paul. They didn't have an encounter with Jesus like Paul did. They spoke of things they knew nothing of. They were powerless against those devils. The same are we, powerless 
when we face the evil of this world, both inwardly, the flesh, and outwardly, without having first an encounter with Jesus. You see, when we have an encounter with Jesus, it's like we have a reference point. We have a testimony. Paul had a testimony. Amen. The sons of Sceva had no testimony. See, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the what? By the word of our testimony. And when the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, we have a reference point with God. So when the enemy tries to deceive you to think that you don't have enough to make ends meet, you have a reference point. You, you may be reminded of a time where God provided for you right in the nick of time. You're reminded whenever he may have healed that loved one who was on their deathbed. deathbed. Paul had an encounter with God, and after persecuting the church at the appointed time, God knocked him off of his self-righteous pedestal. He was zealous for the wrong thing. Zealous for the wrong thing. Paul experienced salvation and healing all in one encounter. Remember, he was blinded. God saved him and healed him all in one. Now, when Paul addresses the church, not churches abroad, he spoke from a from a place of experience with God. He experienced the power of God, and his ministry was founded on that powerful experience on the Damascus Road. Paul's ministry was effective and strong because, call, I'm sorry, because Paul relied on God's strength and not on his own. I have a question. Have you experienced God? Have you had an encounter with the Most High God? An encounter with Jesus? As a reference point for strength? If you haven't, before the night closes, you have an opportunity to believe on Jesus as your Savior and have a reference point and have an encounter with him. To so apply your faith. Too many times the ministry of our marriage the ministry of our family, the ministry of our health, even the ministry of our finances, the ministry of our witness as followers of Christ is ineffective and powerless because we are relying on our own strength and not on the strength of the Almighty God. Let's look at Ephesians 6, verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. I'm going to read a few verses, 10 through 8 here. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And whose might? His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So your flesh and blood strength has doesn't line up. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Bear with me. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I wanted to read through that to pose another question. Whose armor is it? It's God's armor. It's God's armor. So whose strength is it ultimately? It's God's strength. 
As I'm studying this, there's a parallel that came to my understanding whenever Saul tried to give David his armor. It was almost like a type, a reference to this. Saul was given David, wanted to give David his armor for all the wrong reasons. You recall? It's almost like he wanted everybody to see his armor and think that David was going to fight in battle, but it really was Saul. He wanted to get the glory. He wanted to get the accolades of being the brave one. He didn't know if David was going to really conquer Goliath or not. But he was too scared to even try. So he was going to put, on the, on, on, put David with his armor. The parallel in this is that God gives us his armor. Saul's armor didn't even fit David at all. God's armor, although it's his armor, it fits us. We're all different sizes, but it fits us. It's almost as though like, uh, like Black Panther. Anybody who put the suit on, it formed around them. It fit them perfectly. God's armor fits all of us perfectly. Perfectly. Therefore, it's no longer our strength. It is his strength. So when David looked at Saul's armor, he was like, that's weird. It's huge. I'm short. You tall. That's not working. We can look at the armor of God and say, yes, it works. And it works perfectly. It works entirely. It's the strength that I need. Whose armor is it? It's God's armor. And that brings us peace. It brings us comfort. Do you have some armor at home? No. I got a helmet, a hard hat, and I don't think that's going to work. I got some cleats. I don't think that's going to work. But the armor of God, that's going to work. That's going to work. We're talking about the strength of God against evil. Against evil. And you can say against temptation. You try to fight temptation in your own strength. It's not going to work. At all. God's strength against evil. And God's strength is effective in other places as well. So point C. Strength to serve. Strength to serve. God gives us strength to serve him. We see this in 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 14. The Bible says this. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, Paul saying, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, I was wrong, Paul said. I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I thank Christ, our Lord, who has enabled me, who has strengthened me, who has empowered me, who has given me might, his might. Yes, to do what, Paul? To serve in the ministry. This is a beautiful, beautiful perspective to have when serving in ministry. Yes, sir. He's saying that he is thankful to Christ who gives him the strength to serve in spite of his past. In spite of his past. Yes, Anybody have a past? Yes, sir. Anybody have a dark past? Yes, sir. I think we all have. Paul is saying <clears throat> to serve Jesus, be, or he's saying I serve Jesus because of his mercy. Because of the mercy he has shown me. Like how we said at the beginning of the service, he's our object of worship. The same is true in service. He's our object of service. He's the object of our service. Help me, Holy Spirit. I heard a pastor say, uh, we serve people for the glory and acceptance of God. But sometimes we get it twisted. We serve God for the glory and acceptance of man. Paul, had it, you had it right right here. We keep God as the object of our service. The object of our, because who strengthens us to serve? God does. 
I wonder if any of us experience burnout or serving fatigue, or maybe even low impact in your service, because the link between our service, the link between our hands, our service, and the link between our thankfulness to God for his mercy, our heart, is broken or unattached. To put it another way, I wonder if any of us experience burnout in, in serving. It can be in church, it can be at home, being weary and well-doing. Experience some serving fatigue. You don't feel like serving, you don't feel called to serve. Or maybe you're serving and you feel like it's just low impact. Perhaps the link between your service, your actions, and your thank thankfulness for God's mercy is a little broken or a little weak. You need some strength in that area. Yeah. It's a matter of perspective. Why are you serving? Who are you serving? What are you serving for? When we serve, we serve in the strength that God supplies, not in our own. Therefore, he is the object of service. 1 Peter 4.11. <clears throat> If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified. Through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. I like that text so much, I think I want to read it again. If anyone speaks... If anybody want to speak, and teach, or minister, or serve, let them speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, that word minister means to serve. If anyone serves, let him do as with the ability, as with the strength, as with the force, as with the empowerment, which who supplies? <clears throat> which God supplies. That in all things, God may be glorified. Through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Y'all give God some praise on that. That's a good one. Praise to the Most High. Why is this important? That in all things, God may be glorified. It's the purpose of service. The purpose of ministry. For the souls of men. Why? Why? What's, what's the soul stuff? What, what's all this about the souls of men and being saved? It's what, that's the glory of God. That's, why God. that's why Jesus came to earth, to suffer and die for our sins, to make an atonement, to make a payment for the, our sin debt. He served. This is the purpose of our service, that Yahshua, Jesus, the Christ, be glorified forever. Let that sink in. Forever. Forever. That should be the meditation of our heart. Jesus is our, um, our object of service, our object of worship. And the purpose of it is to, to worship, glorify him forever. Forever. Let that be the meditation of our hearts when we serve one another. When you go home and you cook that meal for the husband, for the wife, and you go home and you take care of your children, that's ministry, that's service. Yeah. It's not just in these four walls. When you're at work and you're dealing with that, that co worker who don't have anything, to good, anything good to say about anything, on, the negative Nancys. In all things, God may be glorified through Christ Jesus, to whom belongs all the glory and dominion forever. I ask the question, why are you serving tonight? Why? I ask a lot of questions. That wasn't always the case. In school, I didn't want to ask any questions. 
But the question is, why are you serving tonight? Let the Holy Spirit minister. Where are you serving? Where is it a challenge? Is it to do a good deed? You just want to do something good for people? You want to be a good person? Is it for notoriety? Is it for accolades? Are you serving because you want, you want to wear a hat? You want to wear a crown? Are you serving just because you want to be the pious one? You want to be different. You want to be known as the one, the giver. Church, we serve that God may be glorified. That God be glorified. That God be glorified. Last point. God gives us strength in several ways. Gives us strength to forgive. See if I can remember. Strength to forgive. Strength to serve. Strength against evil. We're working together tonight. And the last one. Strength for atonement. Strength for atonement. Only God had and has the strength to pay the price for our sins. We've been, we've been reiterating that throughout the service. I have a little book I want to read from by the author, A.W. Tozer. And the title of the book is Paths to Power. Paths to Power. A.W. Tozer says this. Among the things which only God can do, only God has the power, the strength, the might to do, to do this. Of first importance to us is the work of redemption. Atonement, that's the payment for your sins, the settling of your sin debt, our sin debt. Atonement was accomplished in that holy place. Think of the tabernacle. Who went into that holy place? Not everybody. Atonement was accomplished in that holy place where none but a divine Savior could come. That glorious work owes nothing to the effort of any man. The best of Adam's race, the best of us, could add nothing there. We don't have the strength, the power, the might. It was all of God. And man could simply have no part. Christ's work on Calvary made atonement for every man. But it did not save any man. Salvation is personal. It is redemption made effective toward the individual. Salvation is the work of God in the heart, made possible by the work of God on the cross. It's all God. No man can forgive his own sins. No man can regenerate his own heart. Only the power of God. No man can declare himself justified and clean. When the songwriter says we lift up holy hands, well, who made those hands holy? All this is the work of God in man, flowing out of the work which Christ already done for man. Universal atonement makes salvation universally available, but it does not make it universally effective to the individual. Until he believes. Salvation is by faith through grace. Unto every man who believes. And this is an, our opportunity to believe. You heard the word. You know the gospel. What's the gospel? We've all fallen short. We've all sinned. We can do the ABCs, right? We just have to admit that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As I was meditating on this, you know what that, that is? The, the A point, admitting that you're a sinner? That's repentance. That's you looking square with your own sins and saying, I've done wrong. Come on, come on. That whole list, if you can write a list for yourself, yeah, I've done it all. I've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I believe on the work of the cross that only Jesus had the strength to complete but there will be no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. 
Not mom and daddy's blood, but the blood of the lamb, the sinless lamb of God. Believing on Jesus, his perfect life, sinless life, his death, burial, and his resurrection. And confess that he is Lord. And you'll be saved. That measure of faith that we use is not supplied in and of ourselves. The Bible says that he supplies every man a measure of faith. If you're willing to use that measure tonight, pray with me. Say, Most High God, I come before you in the name of your Son, Yahshua, the Savior, who suffered and died on the cross, who bled for my sins. I believe on his sacrifice as the payment for my sins. The debt that I owed was paid on the cross. I believe that supremely and entirely. Jesus saved me a sinner. And the Holy Spirit, fill me with your presence. Fill me with your power, with your strength, with your might, your supernatural might. And lead me to live a life for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Not bad, not bad. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Let me bless you on your way out. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace and grace. That you depart tonight, that you would experience the strength, the supernatural power of God. Not only today, not only this week, but the, for, the, for the remainder of your days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.